Ah, Guardian. Greetings. I need to speak with you. I thought you might. I know that you're wise enough to know when to ask for a little assistance. Fire team's full. We don't need more guns. <laughs> You'd be wrong to think I was offering our guns in the first place. You know why I came here. You're better informed on this subject matter than our team. You know how dangerous this is going to be. Wrong again. I don't know how dangerous this really is. I don't think anyone does. And that's what scares me. Anyone who thinks they know anything about this is gravely mistaken. So why am I here? Because of what she did to Osiris? Because you're not one of Ikora's hidden? And the Queen and the Empress aren't exactly sharing their intelligence? I'm the one you trust who's most likely to know about Savathun. So? Tell me about her. Tell me about the Witch Queen. I know the knowledge might be dangerous. Yes, but I don't know if you know how dangerous. Ignorance was Crow's shield, until he knew the truth she revealed to him. Not to mention, what I tell you could be wrong. All the others out there, who've also studied, they know just as well as I, the stories we've heard, they could all be lies. That's the problem with fighting a god of deception. Ah, and there it is. God of deception. How exactly did she come to be? How far does her deception go? You saw the extent of it all. You saw Osiris, but you also saw that something was wrong. Perhaps given more time or a little luck, you'd have seen through her web. All these years we've been chasing her, and we're not the first, Might. Not even the first Guardians. Do you really believe you can defeat Savathun? I don't believe I know if any of us are strong enough. We can't know for sure. But it doesn't matter. Our advantage has never been knowing. It's been doing. You speak no falsehoods. And you make no foolish assumptions. Perhaps there is yet hope. Very well. I shall tell you. You shall learn of her dynasty.
If you wish to learn of the Witch Queen, you must learn of the dynasty that brought her to power, the Osmium Dynasty. Once ruled by her brother Oryx, now left in ruin as the siblings are scattered. The dynasty predates the Guardians, it predates the Elixni, it predates even the Hive that they birthed. The Hive whose story we now tell. What we know of the Hive's beginning is found in the Books of Sorrow, an ancient record of the Hive and their gods. It is perhaps the oldest credible record we have if it isn't full of lies, which is a stern possibility. It begins in the mists of time, long ago, on a world called Fundament. Fundament was supposedly a gas giant of remarkable size, so large, in fact, that its gravity would drag other worlds into the murky depths of its clouds, where they would crash onto the oceans beneath. This was the fate of the Hive and their world. But of course, this was before they were the Hive. This was when they were known as the Krill. One day, when visiting the gargantuan tungsten monoliths, one amongst their number discovered this truth, that the Krill were not of Fundament. This changed everything. She then knew that the timid truth that her people believed, that they were destined to die as the smallest things on this world, was not a truth at all. The name of this pioneer who discovered the truth of her people's origin was Orash, and she was the heir to the Osmium throne, one of the warring fiefdoms of the Krill people. Alongside her sisters, Sathona and Shiro, Orash stood in line to the Osmium throne, ruled over by her father, who was only ever identified as the Old King. The Krill used to live short lives, and at the age of ten, their father was considered ancient to the point of becoming senile. We do not know how completely tenuous his grasp on power was, but we know that one amongst the Osmium court, Teox, would be the one to eventually bring his downfall. Teox was a sterile mother of the Krill, and she was cursed perhaps with foresight. Imbued with long life and a cunning streak, she saw that the Osmium King was weak, and believed that none of his three daughters would be fit to rule if they took the King Morph. Perhaps there was more to Teox's intent, perhaps not. It matters little as it would not change what happened next. Teox communed with a rival Krill power known as the Helium Drinkers. Their warriors had commonly raided the Osmium Court, and their ambassadors took regular tribute in the form of ten young krill to be devoured. Teox communed with the helium drinkers through secret communications and asked them to kill the Osmium King and his heirs so that they might lead the Osmium Court instead. She planned to coordinate with them when their conquest was complete, and she would rule as their regent. The plan was to strike when the old king of the Osmium Court next sequestered himself within the royal orrery to observe the 52 moons of Fundament. This had been his obsession of late, one that he undertook late into the night, with his familiar always at his side. A curious dead thing, a white worm that had washed up onto the shores of the court one day. He kept it in a glass and attended to it, even as the matters of the court crashed around him. On that visit to the orrery, the old king brought Orash, his eldest daughter and heir to the throne with him, and imparted unto her knowledge of a terrible fate that had consumed his every waking thought. By observing the moons and their paths through the sky, the king foresaw an apocalypse born of water and gravity. He foresaw the Syzygy. When all 52 moons of Fundament aligned perfectly with one another, they would pull the oceans of Fundament upward, towards them, into a great bulging mass. When the alignment had passed, this water would be released, spilling out into a wave that would drown the whole of Fundament, the god wave that would come to claim them all. But what was perhaps worse, were the signs that the Syzygy seemed to be unnatural 
as the motion of the very moons themselves had seemingly been bent to accommodate such a disastrous outcome. This fear of the impending apocalypse would be what passed from the king to his eldest daughter. Finding some way to survive the syzygy would be Aurash's quest, and the duty to save her people would be her inheritance. There was little time for the king and his daughter to plan for the survival of their people. At this moment, the krill of the helium drinkers attacked and broke upon the osmium court with ferocious speed. The three heirs fled, but while Ulrush stole away with the knowledge of impending doom, Sathona happened to steal away with her father's familiar after he himself was cut down by the usurpers. They escaped onto a ship and fled their home, which was now fallen to the machinations of Teox and the blades of the helium drinkers. But this was not the end of their story. It was, in fact, hardly even the beginning. The three siblings stood upon the deck of the ship they had made their escape in, and they swore vengeance upon its mast. Each took a knife in their right hand and stabbed it through their left as they held it to the mast. Each swore upon one of their eyes to avenge their father, to retake their home, and to save their people from the coming apocalypse. Time passed, and the three sisters made their way across the open ocean. For a year they explored and adventured, being guided by Sathona's mad ideas, ideas that she had been gifted by the familiar. The dead worm whispered to her in secret when they were alone. It guided her through dangerous waters and harrowing storms, until eventually, the siblings found upon a boon that would deliver them to their fate. The Needle Found within a far-off maelstrom, the Needle was an artifact of high technology. A ship designed not to sail on the surface of an ocean, but through the void of its depths. They explored within, and discovered the grisly fate of the crew within the ship's interior, within its flesh gardens. Some vile thing had been birthed in there, something that the crew had clearly found in the deep oceans. They had been slaughtered, and thus their ship had been washed up, only to be found by the siblings. Shiro, youngest of the three, but with a warrior's heart, perceived the dangers found in the deep, and after seeing the remnants of the slaughter, wondered if they should perhaps sell the ship at the great city of Kahanatol, where the many species of fundament all congregated to trade. With such funds from the sale, they might have been able to afford an army of mercenaries to retake their home. But Sathona, who had listened to the whispers of the worm, told her sister that the needle was worthless. It would not buy them an army at Kahanatol, but it would deliver them to their destiny. Over two years, they repaired the ship, and then, one day, under the pressure that the time of their short lives had forced upon them, they dove into the depths of Fundament. They were drawn there in the hope that they might discover more time, more life, and a solution to their people's impending doom. Such were the whispered promises of their father's familiar. Such was its unknown intent. Regardless, they dove into oblivion, and in those dark, unfathomable depths, surrounded by the nightmarish creatures of Fundament's deepest oceans, they would discover their fate. After passing through the darkest of the ocean's crushing depths, the needle came to a place of silence deep below the plates and continents moving above. Here in the twilight stillness, Shiro, Sathona, and Urash listened, and they heard their doom. Above them, through the darkness, they could sense the rising of the oceans. They could hear the moons above pulling them skyward. Perhaps their father was right. Perhaps the ZZG was real. Suddenly, Shiro was overtaken by a sense of impending doom. Something else was down here in the deep with them. Something secret, something ancient, a harbinger of their future. 
and there it was, the Leviathan. Words perhaps fail to portray the enormity of this beast. Its magnitude was beyond reckoning, larger than the continents that the siblings had known in their childhood. Down here in the depths, it must have lived for eons, gathering wisdom and watching the world above. It dwarfed their vessel, and its voice boomed into the needle and into the minds of the siblings. Its warning was simple. You must turn back. Save yourselves from the deep. Save the world from yourselves. You must turn back. Perhaps when faced with such a monster, you and I might have fled and heeded its word. Perhaps we might have died of terror at the sight of such an incomprehensible creation of the universe. With our knowledge of the crushing horrors that lie between the stars, we might look upon such a creature and know that our lives were but a nothingness to this creature, that we were less than minnows to it, and that in its mind could breed plans spanning hundreds of millennia and madness so complete that no corner of the mind would be spared of its grasp. But the three sisters did not have the luxury of long lives, and they had long since abandoned fear. They were bound by the determination born of their oath. They would stand, they would listen, but they would not flee. The Leviathan spoke of a coming war. It warned of a conflict that would span across the universe, between the deep and the sky, between formless and form. It warned them here of the cosmic war, the eternal war between light and dark. It warned of the dark forces threatening the life-rich fundament and all the trillions of living beings upon its surface. This is the first recorded instance of the mention for the wars of light and dark a confirmation of a conflict that has been raging since before the dawn of time. A conflict that if the darkness itself is to be believed, may have been the cause for time's birth and the universe's creation. This divine and abhorrent presence, the Leviathan, had revealed to these three seemingly insignificant creatures the truth of the universe and the war at its heart. But perhaps more astoundingly than all that the Leviathan said, was what happened next. Dumbstruck, perhaps, at the audacity of such a moment, it stopped and listened as Orash, first heir of the Osmium dynasty, responded in protest to its words. She said that the world of Fundament was not some refuge for the Krill, who lived short, hard lives and died in the dark. The Leviathan had pleaded for them not to venture further into the deep, but Orash knew that there was no hope above, only the inevitable doom of rising moons and the death that would surely follow as they drowned the world. She pleaded to be allowed deeper where there might be some hope of survival. The Leviathan lamented that this was the way things always were. When hope died and when safety crumpled to ash, Life always turned to the ways of the deep to survive. So it was with the siblings that lay before it. The Leviathan said that it had watched the Krill's struggle, and that to it in its magnitude, their struggle represented some strange hope. It hoped that they might not fall into ruin and follow the ways of the darkness. It said that they should turn away from the deep and choose the sky instead. Perhaps spurred on by her brash nature, perhaps emboldened by her sister's courage, Shiro also retorted. She rejected the Leviathan's claim that the sky was better, knowing that their lives on the surface were short and hard, and that the Osmium Court had suffered. This way of the world had allowed the traitor Teox to flourish, and had allowed evil to steal away her father. She would not accept that this was the way the world should be, and vowed to beat the world as a drum until it changed, to kill any who stood in her way. The Leviathan responded again, but perhaps it knew its chances of convincing the siblings were all but naught. 
It told them that their logic was fatal to the world. For the Deep's conviction was that to exert power on the world required death, and this was exactly the length to which Shiro would go to save her people. With the last of its breath, it begged the siblings to reconsider once more, saying that yes, the way of the sky was harder, but that it was also kinder. Had they turned back in this moment and accepted the harder path, untold trillions upon trillions of lives could have been saved. Whole civilizations that we will never know could have been spared from the torch and the inhabitants of Sol might never have been laid low at Mare Ibrium, at Saturn, in the Dreaming City, and beneath the Traveler in humanity's final bastion. But the familiar had whispered to Sathona, and as she spoke, she spoke with its words and its intent. So it was that the one who would one day be known as the Witch Queen sealed the fate of the siblings and their people, saying, Sisters, I have my father's familiar. Look, it answers me in plain words. It helped me find this ship. It gives me strength when hope is lost. Who will you trust? The voice that wants us to live and suffer as we have lived and suffered? The Leviathan that offers no hope against Teox or the World Wave? Or the plain, honest worm? Let us see where its whisper leads us, Urash. Let us go deeper, Shiro. Let us dive, O oh sisters mine. What happened next is not clear. The Leviathan might have been too exhausted to prevent their passage, or it might in its enormity have tried to stop them. Either way, the siblings ended up stranded in the depths of Fundament. The needle crashed into a darkness so deep that they would have seemed forgotten by the world. In such a deep grave, whose shadow was darker than blood, this should have been the end of their tale. But something darker still waited for them down in the deep. They had followed the whispers of the worm, and now they would hear its roar. Eternity 
Aurosh. We offer you a chance at the universe. Would you deny your people infinity? Reach up to me. Let my flesh be your sacrament. The Worm Gods, these ancient beings of untold power and darkness, offered their pact to the siblings. They offered immortality through their newborn larvae, which the siblings would ingest willingly. They offered the power to make the world as they saw fit, and to change it at their whim. There was, however, one restraint. The siblings would be shackled to their worms. They would have to obey their natures to feed them. As the siblings' strength grew, so too would the worm's appetite. The ramifications of such a bargain would lead to calamity on a scale that cannot be described, but it would give the siblings everything they needed. To take vengeance on the helium drinkers, to bring Taox to justice, to live long lives that would allow them to make a difference, and to save their people from the coming storm. Thus, the Pact of the Deep was struck, and the siblings ascended. Shiro, the brave, the warrior, would ascend into the Night Morph and would take up a new name, Shivua Wrath. Sathona, the cunning, the treacherous, would ascend into the Mother Morph and would take up a new name, Savathun. Orash, the eldest, the navigator of great designs, would ascend into the King Morph and would take up a new name, Alrix. Their ascension was swift, and their return to the surface led them back to their home, the Osmium Court. No longer helpless as they had been in their youth, they freed their people and rent asunder the helium drinkers with tooth and claw and blade. So it was that at long last, Aurix would be coronated under the flag of a liberated people in the blood of the helium drinkers, in the wake of a fleeing traitor and beneath a shroud of darkness. Teox's dominion was shattered, her plans undone, and the new power of the Osmium dynasty was in ascent. In the act of their return to the surface, Aurix, Savathun, and Shivua Wrath had brought the children of the Worm Gods with them, and they offered the Worm Gods bounty to the Osmium Court. Here they imparted their curse and their strength upon the newly liberated subjects that they had gained. The Krill of the Osmium Court reveled in their new power, and spread war to both the Helium Drinkers and to all of Fundament. 511 species were present upon the world, and it was surmised by the Worm Gods that at least one of them had to have the technology required to leave this planet and to escape the God Wave. Thus did the first war begin. The first true war of this newly arisen dynasty. As they forged their conquest across the surface, Shivar Wrath led the armada of the Osmium Court's forces against all the races of Fundament. Soon it was revealed by the Worm Gods that the God Wave approached, and that the Leviathan had agents determined to trap the Krill here on Fundament. But the Worm Gods had plans for their grand escape, plans that were already being sown. The Leviathan's agents were destroying the technology that would allow the siblings' departure, and so instead, the Worm Gods saw that another logic could escort them to the stars. The logic of the sword. But such logic would require power. Power in the form of slaughter en masse. And so Shivua Wrath led her armies in their thousands to Kahan Atoll, 
where Teox had rallied the forces of Fundament to oppose them. It was the font within which the determination of a new people and the blood of their victims would coalesce. For the first time, they stood with elation atop the bones of their foes, not as survivors, but as conquerors, crushing all that faced their wrath and sweeping them back into the sea. From the deaths of the defenders, the Worm Gods cut a wound in reality using the powers of darkness, allowing the forces of the Osmium Court to rise and assault the moons of Fundament, leaving behind their watery grave of a world never to return again. But as they rose, not all was right. The young King Alrix saw the devastation before him and felt doubt. With the reassurances of the Worm Gods that such destruction was just, he would continue. But it would take something more for him to truly embrace such a ruinous position as the one he had selected for his people. He did not understand the sword logic. Not yet. Within the orbit of Fundament, the Krill and the Worm Gods spread out and infested many of the surrounding moons as territory. But it was soon discovered that a 53rd imposter moon also haunted the system. A divine presence of the sky, an object of loathing for the new gods of the Krill, and perhaps a convenient scapegoat in their narrative. We would know it as the Traveler. It had settled above one of the icy moons of Fundament, a world which was the capital of a species of six-armed bony cephalopods. Savathun named them the Ammonite, and the Worm Gods saw that Teox had fled to their moon. Upon her arrival, the Ammonite gladly offered her asylum, Battle lines were once again forming, and both the Krill and the Ammonite prepared for war. The next stage of the siblings' path was clear, but it would be harder fought than the battle on Fundament's surface. The Krill met stiff resistance, particularly from the Ammonite's Chroma Admiral, Rafreet. He pushed the forces of the Krill back to the Sixth Moon, where once again the Worm Gods were forced to burrow to survive. Whilst Shivu Arath and Savathun attended the war and brought slaughter to the enemy, Ulrich's resolve was tested. He clung to the ideals of peace and stability, and without his guidance, the Krill could not maintain their offensive successfully. He was briefly returned to war by the hunger of his worm and the curiosity to understand the Ammonites' newly found paracausal weapons gifted by the grace of the Traveler. With their enemy's new power revealed, the Worm Gods began to arm Savathun's covens of witches with the power of the darkness to fight back. Such darkness required a more intimate understanding of the Deep's claim of the logic of the sword. Such teachings came easier to some than to others. With the new escalation of the war, Alrix's resolve faltered entirely. He sent word to the Ammonite's Satellite Congress that he wished to parley on neutral ground and sought peace. To this, his sovereign deities writhed in their fury with a newfound resentment born of Alrix's audacity. They had put up with his need to learn the lessons of the Deep before, but this was a step too far, an affront to all their beliefs and an insult from the one who they had exalted to kingship. And so, before he could meet with the Ammonite's envoys on the sterile moon, Alrix was betrayed. Savathun, his own sister, showed her dedication to the sword that day. She assassinated her own brother at the whims of the worms. Alrix sat in darkness, contemplating his betrayal a betrayal at his sister's own hands, when the voice of Yule brought him to his senses. The honest worm explained that he had died, but that he was no longer bound by the weak limitations of mortality. Instead, they found themselves within his throne world, a cyst in the universe which he could use to recover if he was ever killed. 
They also explained that Savathun had taken his place at the Parley and had poisoned the Dry Moon, rendering such talks of peace impossible. They imparted upon him the understanding of the greater truth of the sword logic. The strong shall survive, and the weak shall perish at their hands. They also told him that Teox, who he had hoped to find at the parley upon the Dry Moon, had evaded him once more. Bitterness must have welled within the young king then. This was the final lesson needed for Alrix to complete his work. When he ventured out into the universe again, he was ready for the battles to come. And so the Krill began to turn the tide against the Ammonite. It was at this moment that the Leviathan broke cover and moved from Fundament's surface into the space around the moons. Previously, the Chroma Admiral Rafrit had been able to run circles around Shiva Orath's forces, using mobility as a spear and a sword alike. But now he was left with the task of defending the Leviathan as it moved from the oceans of Fundament into open space. Now was the time for the Creel to strike. As their armies pursued it, the Leviathan spoke for a final time, saying, seemingly to the siblings, Ruin. Grief and ruin. The Krill lost. The Ammonite ravaged. Our travelers work undone. Sisters of Orrush, open your eyes. Who made you monsters? Who summoned the wave? Make peace. Join with me in golden renewal. But Orrush and her sisters were no more. In their place stood Aurix and Savathun and Shivor Rath, and together with their old dead names cast aside, they had become something greater, something strong enough to challenge the universe and all its supposed rules, rules that would never again confine their destiny. Their true natures had been revealed, and they would be ascendant. The Leviathan was rebuked on that day with sword and logic and word. We cannot know the scale of the battle that followed, but we do know that at its conclusion, the Leviathan fell, the Chroma Admiral and the Ammonite lay dead, and both Teox and the Traveler had retreated. Thus the butchery of Fundament was complete. A strange question to which we may never know the answer is whether the words of the Leviathan were true. It implied that the Worm Gods were the cause of the God Wave and had turned the three siblings into monsters. The Worm Gods themselves had blamed the Traveler for the apocalyptic wave that had consumed all of Fundament below. Perhaps the truth of the matter is found in studies of the darkness and its weapons. Perhaps the truth of the matter has already been spoken. And perhaps the truth matters not, for the heirs to the Osmium dynasty had already made their choice, in their words and in their hearts. The Worm Gods decreed that they would become crusaders for the Deep, and would advance the Sword Logic's cause across the universe. Thus, the Osmium dynasty would follow the path of the Sword forevermore. So it was that in the depths of Fundament's moons, which had been wrested from the control of Fundament's gravity, the Krill began to change. Thus was the new shape of their lives described. From their larvae came the Thrall in their magnitude, who swarm and consume. From the Thrall came the Acolytes, who scheme and attend. From the Acolytes came Knights and Wizards, who challenged and ascended if they were successful. Those who ascended would be princes amongst this new people, but at their apex stood the siblings, Alrix, Savathun, and Shivua Rath, the lords and gods of a new species, bound forever to the will of the darkness. It was here, in this most terrible hour, 
that the krill died, and from their decaying memory, the hive were born. The three siblings of the Osmium dynasty busied themselves with expanding their broods and their throne worlds. Savathun discovered that by practicing the sword logic, the Hive could become strong enough to break through to their throne worlds by creating the same wounds in reality that the Worm Gods had used to take them from Fundament's surface to its orbit. Thus, Ulrix established the High War, his court, a place where those skilled in the sword logic could contend against each other and where new understandings would be earned. Savathun established a court of her own, known as the High Coven, whose secrets may be deeper and darker than those of any other organization in the universe. And Shivor Rath said that her court was the world, for wherever there was war, she would be exalted. As their war moons traveled through the darkness of space, a war began between the siblings. This was not a war for conquest, though. This war was like a whetstone, strengthening the hive and bringing them closer to a more complete understanding of the sword logic. And so, the hive conducted war upon one another for 20,000 years. The worlds shook beneath their rage, and the worms, their gods, were pleased. With so much bloodshed, the Hive had grown mighty, and went about the business of liberating life from the bounds of its mortal coil. For if it could not stand and resist them, it did not deserve to exist. This is the sword logic. The idea that existence is the struggle to exist. The idea that only those who are strongest will ultimately survive. A movement towards an ever-sharpening point of the universe, where a single ultimate being might be able to rule against all others. A single pattern that would be able to defeat all those who came before it. A pattern that would be known as the Final Shape. The Hive began to commit their genocidal campaigns against the many species of the universe. But this did not mean that they were not constantly attempting to sharpen themselves with infighting and challenges. In one such campaign against a race known as the Kugu, Ulrix's fleet fired upon Savathun's and destroyed her ship, decimating her and her brood in the process. Savathun would survive, of course. Her throne world had been well established, just like that of Ulrix. But as Ulrix stood in the ruins of his sister's fleet, he contemplated the sword logic and his worm. He comprehended that even with the eclipsing of whole worlds, his worm was still hungry, and whilst the Hive moved inexorably towards the true nature of the sword logic, they still struggled to define its ultimate truth, the so-called final shape. Ulrich sensed weakness within himself. Upon the extermination of his 306th world, he was beset by the belief that his worm's hunger would outpace his ability to feed it. For even with the destruction and genocide of entire species, the worms within the three siblings would continue to grow hungry, ravenous as time progressed. Alrix, for the first time, beheld the terrible possibility of his own defeat through attrition. This is the final challenge of the Hive. The knowledge that when all life has been scoured from the universe, they will be able to do nothing but consume themselves. But the greatest challenge that they had yet to face was on the horizon, and it would arrive at the behest of their old nemesis. 
Far out in the galaxy, there was a mighty star empire. What we know of them is limited, but we know that they called themselves the Acumenae, a highly advanced society which maintained contact with many other star empires or simple peoples throughout space. One day, a group of mercenaries associated with the Acumenae discovered something remarkable, a krill vessel with intact life pods that had fled from Fundament. Within one of these life pods, they discovered Teox, the sterile traitor mother, the one who Ulrix, Savathun, and Sivuar Roth had sworn to kill. Through some means or another, she was able to communicate with them, and then she was debriefed and put into the service of the Acumene. There she would provide them with all her knowledge of the heirs to the Osmium dynasty. The Acumene assumed a stance that might otherwise be described as overkill, but their new knowledge told them that this was absolutely necessary. They would dedicate all the resources of their empire to the destruction of the Hive, and wherever the siblings were found, they would respond with overwhelming force. They would give the Hive no quarter, and were ruthless in the way that they conducted their war. Their campaigns pitted the entirety of their state's industry towards a single goal, the destruction of the siblings. So the battles of the Acumene conflict commenced. This was not the first time that the Hive had been opposed by a species seeking to survive extinction, but this was the first time that the Hive seemed to have met their match. In battle after battle, at system after system, the Hive were beaten back, and wherever they appeared, Ulrix, Shivuarath, and Savathun were slaughtered by the Acumene without hesitation. With each mounting defeat, the hunger of the worms within the siblings began to grow more ravenous and more desperate. Eventually, a tipping point was reached. The Hive had been defeated so many times that the siblings were in danger of being devoured. They assembled in Ulrix's throne world. It was a moment of desperation, but they had to find a way to defeat the Acumene. They had to find a solution, no matter the cost. I am at my end. I plot and plan, but I cannot gather enough bloodshed to feed my worm. And the harder I try, the hungrier it becomes. I slaughter and kill, but the harder I fight, the more my worm demands. I too am at my end. The Acumene War Angels have killed me so many times that I dare not go out into the universe, lest I need my might to protect myself. My worm chews at my soul and hunger. We should retire and gather our strength. We should beg the worm, our god, to tell us what to do. Have you learned nothing? Would you deny our purpose? Whatever we do, we will do by killing, by an act of war and might. That is the final arbiter we serve, that violent arbiter, and if we turn away from it, we deserve to be eaten. No, we must obey our natures. We must be long-sighted and cunning and strong. We must take this gift, the worm, our god has given us this challenge and find a way to keep existing. How will we feed our worms? I know. I know a way. But it won't work unless we are killing the Acumenine by the billions. How can we beat them? If we cannot beat their strengths, we must infect their weaknesses. But they are lords of matter and physical law. I know a way, but it will require great power. More power than any one of us can claim. 
then kill me. And use that killing logic. The power you prove by killing something as mighty as me. And strangle me. Use that killing logic. The cunning you prove by killing something as smart as me. This was Ulrich's choice, slaughter, and through it, power. With the slaughter of his sisters complete, Ulrich knew what he had to do next. He departed to find Akka, the Worm of Secrets. Akka, who held the secret power to commune with the Deep. He would not come to petition the beast for its power, though. He came to take it by force. It was in this moment that he could show that he truly understood the power of the sword logic and what it demanded. He could not ask for the power to be given, for giving was of the sky, and the deep demands that one should take. But you gave us Ramarafi, the worm, and that is why the worm devours us now. Because it was given, not taken. So, I must take what I need from you, although you are my god. With the death of his god, Alrix took the secret power of the worm, the power to commune with the deep. 
He recorded this secret on a series of tablets that he called the Tablets of Ruin, which he hung about his waist. And so he said, Now I may speak to the deep, the beautiful final shape. I will be king of shapes. I will learn all the secrets of our destiny. His speech to the deep was not recorded, but it is known that when he returned from the deep, he was wreathed in its unholy black flame and stood victorious with proclamation, saying, Now I am Oryx the Taken King, and I have the power to take all life and make it my own. Then Oryx went out into the world and fought the Acumene with his tablets, and the worm, his god, was pleased. When next the Hive rallied their forces and faced the Acumene, they once more saw the powers of this great empire deployed to their fullest. Once again, their forces were responding with overwhelming numbers to crush the Hive. But this time, the Hive Swarm was led by the Taken King, and this time he grasped a power that none could comprehend or countermand. With his newfound power to take, the Acumene were left in utter disarray. Those who he afflicted became the Taken. They were torn from our reality and corrupted by darkness, the Deep itself husking them out and leaving them as nothing more than a parody of their former selves, to be puppeted by the Taken King. Against this new power, the forces of the Acumene were left defenseless. Defeat was inevitable. For a hundred years, Oryx made war upon the Acumene forces. At the conclusion of these hundred years, he killed the Acumene Council on the Fractal Wreath. From their blood, and with their death, at the end of a century of ceaseless war, Oryx had invoked a terrible dark sacrament. From their blood arose the sibling he had killed, Sivua Rath, who said, I am war, and you have conjured me back with war. Together they continued to conquer the Acumene, but upon reaching the Dakoa Nest, those who inhabited the space in which Teox's dormant ship had been discovered, Oryx suddenly changed his tone. After warring with the Dakoa Nest for forty years, he spoke with the Acumene of the Nest, telling them that he was jealous of his sister Shivua Rath. He asked for their aid in killing her, and in their desperation the Acumene accepted. But in doing so, the Dakoa Nest had also walked straight into a trap. Thus was the nest exposed. Thus were the Acumene made extinct. From the whispers of their betrayal, and the desecrated carcasses that remained, Savathun too returned through the same form of Dark Sacrament, and she said, I am trickery, and you have conjured me back with trickery. Thus was the extinction of one of their greatest foes complete. Thus were the Hive once again the victors in the great war for the cosmos. Thus did Oryx prove his right to the mantle and title of Taken King. And so he declared his new law, that tribute and destruction would be tithed up the ranks of the Hive from underling to superior. Thus Oryx would receive the tribute that flowed to him from all. Thus Oryx empowered himself and all other Ascendant Hive. Thus the swarm grew, and the Ascendant Hive's worms were fed. But in this moment of great triumph, there was a sting of discontent. The Acumene had harbored Teox, the traitor mother, and yet somehow, yet again, she had evaded the Hive. Oryx, Shivor, Rath, and Savathun were perhaps in this moment spurred on, sent further into rage as they would continue their hunt for the one who had betrayed them all those years ago, the one who had worked with Leviathan and Ammonite and Acumene and all those who had led to the Hive's downfall. 
and so it was that the Hive's campaign of devastation would resume at a pace never before seen. Worlds would behold the wrath of Oryx, coiled for 10,000 years. The eradication of species would become both trivial and routine for the Hive, but they would witness now the newfound powers of their sovereign. Such powers were demonstrated in system after system, and such was the fate that befell the system of Tai Shabeth. The Hive would come to despoil the world and bombard it. They would fight until the greatest champions of the people were revealed. In the case of Tai Shabeth, it was the Tai Emperor Raven, who ripped a whole war moon apart with her talons. Such power within this one being was enough to snuff out a whole brood of Hive. And yet, such power was meaningless before that of the Taken King. He spoke, saying, Listen to me, Emperor Raven, and I shall describe for you the last true shape, which is written on my tablet. He reached out his hand, and it brimmed with darkness, a fire without fuel, that would shed no light and was made of shadow. The Emperor Raven was swallowed in the tear in reality that Oryx had created, and was returned, but moments later. From out of this wound came a perfect Taken Emperor Raven. Her powers augmented with darkness, brought closer to that of the final shape, and in her perfection she obeyed the will of Oryx. On his command, she would spread her wings over the worlds of Tai Shabeth and drowned them in darkness. Never again was a Tai Shabethi child born. Ten paces Oryx took through his throne world as the Tai Shabethi peoples were put to the slaughter. And on the tenth pace, they were made extinct. Such was the power of Oryx that whole civilizations could fall before him without need or thought or word other than his singular power as Taken King. He was left truly unchecked and unchallenged. He addressed his siblings and stated that they had finally conquered their way to the very edge of the deep. Oryx could feel its summons and so prepared to commune once more with their ultimate master. Oryx went deep into his throne world. He ventured out into the abyss and read from the tablets of ruin with each step so that they became like stones beneath his feet, the power of the deep granting him solid ground with its authority in this immaterium. Out in the abyss, he prepared an unborn ogre, a vessel through which death and purpose could coalesce. Oryx called upon the deep, saying, I can see you in the sky. You are the waves which are battle, and the battles are the waves. Come into this vessel I have prepared for you. And then, a terrible silence. Shadow crept in from the recesses of the ascendant plane. A pit of hatred turned its eye toward the vessel that had been prepared and briefly indwelled within the ogre's tortured frame. This place had become darker than any other in the universe, for it had arrived, the darkness itself. It spoke with Oryx as a friend might, but it quickly compelled him to understand the truest depths of the sword logic's majestic purpose. It may have spoken with gentle timber, but it was anything but gentle. It twisted Oryx's visions and returned his mind to a point when he was far younger. He foresaw things that had never happened, visions as though he was his younger self, as though he was Orash once again. The visions showed him many terrors, but they imparted upon him but a single lesson. None could be spared or trusted save for yourself. From these visions, Oryx deduced that Savathun and Shuvor Rath were scheming to strand him here in the Ascendant Realm by cutting off his tribute, making him too weak to return from the Ascendant Plane. But such was the nature of Oryx at this moment 
that he saw the strange hive expression of love in this gesture of betrayal by his siblings. To challenge a foe is to see them grow stronger and to empower them if they do not die. And so it was that strangely enough, if they were worthy of existence, such war was love as love to the hive was war, strange as it might seem. Oryx resolved that when he returned from his journey into the deep, he would have children, sons and daughters who he could love and kill to grow stronger with, champions that would tithe the death knells of worlds to his glory and ensure his dominance over the Osmium throne forevermore. Oryx might have been stranded in the deep, such was the plan that Shivor Roth and Savathun had concocted, but Shivor Roth secretly believed that she would be stronger if she could war against her brother. So it was that she summoned him back by describing him in his totality, just as he had described her with war. When the Taken King had returned, thanks to Shivu's dark sacrament, he did so with purpose and fury, crushing the tribute of his sisters so they might never be strong enough to rise against him ever again. In doing this, Oryx had secured the right to the Taken Throne by power of conquest, and ensured the dominance of him and his progeny for all days to come. Of Oryx's progeny, there were four. The first was Crota, a demon born of fire and rage. His father told him of the struggle that it was to create him and his siblings, of the many battles that he had fought to reach this point, and he spoke to him of their sacred purpose in the universe, the delivery of a swift death to all things in the universe that did not deserve to exist. Crota was gifted nothing, except for one item of power. His sword, the Darkest Edge, a blade that would go on to carve its name upon the ruins of civilizations untold. But this was not the only child born of Oryx, spawned in the name of the king. A second son and two daughter twins were also born, Nokris, Ur Halak, and Ur Anuk. Nokris was not a warrior like his elder brother, but while Crota sharpened his blade, Nokris sharpened his mind, consuming apocrypha and tomes of dark practice and power. Set aside from his siblings, he would often be a comparative afterthought in the pantheon of the Ascendant Hive. Uranuk and Urhalak were powerful twin wizards, born by their father's actions. He had cleft a single larvae in two with his sword, Willbreaker, and instead of dying, one larvae became two. Together they were the Unraveler and the Weaver. Urhalak would inflict pain on the world and break it apart, while Uranuk would weave it back together in a new form of agony as befitting the sword logic. These twin daughters had created many terrible things in their time. Uranuk's power was enough to shatter axioms of the universe, rules that otherwise had to exist, and Urhalak's power gave birth to the infamous Death Song, in which, describing death, it became as powerful as death. Together, those children of the Osmium dynasty were mighty, but they still held only a mere fraction of their father's power. Savathun, now weakened and always opportunistic, sought a way to exploit the weakness of these progeny to her advantage. One day, as Oryx was growing a new pair of wings, he observed his twin daughters dying repeatedly within a wound in reality. Whilst at first he feared that they were trying to go into the deep, his daughters informed him that the deaths were being used to construct what they would call an oversoul, a defense fueled by death and its magic, a defense that could be placed within a hive's throne world. Oryx thought this creation interesting, and instructed Crota to learn from his sisters, for they could teach him much cunning. As Oryx left to observe the deep as it destroyed an ancient fortress world, 
Crota dedicated himself to learning this knowledge, and cut a wound in reality with his sword. But from out of this new space, something reached back. This was Savathun's doing, as she had told the king's firstborn son to cut into that space. Out of the wound came the brass-clad frames of the Vex. They would begin an invasion of Oryx's throne world, and the situation quickly spiraled out of control, as Crota, Uranuk, and Urhalak battled to contain them. Sister wizards, we need you! Close the wound, brother Grota. We will find a cunning way to destroy them, but only after they stop constructing problems on us. Is going to eat our souls. The Vex had manifested a mind that had deduced the sword logic. This was Coria, the Blade Transform, and it established itself by right of conquest and slaughter in Oryx's throne world. For 100 years, the Vex battled within Oryx's domain beating back the forces of his progeny until eventually, Aya, the Keeper of Order, came to Oryx and demanded that he set his house in order. With Aya's words, Oryx returned and swiftly the tide was turned. Much like all those who came before, the Vex were powerless against the power to take. They fought the taken versions of themselves, and their once found power within Oryx's throne world paled in comparison to the true majesty of the Taken King. Quoria retreated, and the Vex invasion ceased. When the battle was won and Quoria was forced to retreat, Oryx turned in fury to his son. He told him, my son, this is your punishment. Come home glorious or die forgotten. With this, he threw Crota into the wound that the Vex had emerged from. At first, Crota begrudgingly carried out his father's command. But in time, as he understood his father's mission, he gained admiration for his vision and would build great temples in honor of his name. He battled throughout history and would become a legendary demon. Though the assault had been ended, the danger to Oryx's throne world had not passed. Even as his son was sent spiraling into the Vex gate network, Savathun plotted to see his throne world weakened further. She told Shivor Wrath of a secret which she could use to infiltrate his throne. Understanding that his seat of power could be assaulted on all sides, 
Oryx then moved swiftly to reinforce it. He announced to the High War, to his court, that he would move his throne world and place it into a dreadnought, a grand vessel that would lead his armada and would make his seat of power all but unassailable. The scale of this task is not to be underestimated. The Dreadnought was constructed from what remained of Arca's scales, using the hammer of Shivur Arath and the scalpel of Savathun. By reading a verse from the Tablets of Ruin, and with the assistance of his entire court, Oryx accomplished the unthinkable. He took his throne world, assist in the fabric of reality, and turned it inside out. He bled his pocket of the Ascendant Realm into real space where the Dreadnought stood, until they were one and the same. When the ship was completed and the rituals finished, to pass into the depths of the Dreadnought would be to enter the depths of Oryx's throne world too. Here, Oryx would be all but invincible. His majesty, complete. Such invincibility would be proven with the next challenge that the Taken King would face. For some time, he had hunted a vessel known as the Nyker Thought Ship, and at last he came upon it, guarded by the brave souls of the Harmonious Flotilla Invincible. But no matter their name, this fleet was nothing before the new power of the Dreadnought, and Oryx would break the final word in their title. He sank his sword deep into the Dreadnought's hull, and his throne world swelled out to engulf the flotilla as it surrounded his new capital. Oryx boarded the Nyka Thought Ship, searching for his true prize, something known as the Gift Mast. But there he found the Nyka Thought Ship to be host to a most pathetic trap. The Blade Transform was aboard, and it attempted to assail him with all of its ill-begotten knowledge. Alas, this strategy was ultimately pointless. Quadria would be taken, just like all those before it who had opposed the King of Shapes. But in its final moments, it created something of great consequence. It simulated Oryx as he was in his childhood. It simulated Oryx without his King Morth, without his worm, without his wings, and his weapon, and his power, and his darkness. It simulated Orash. In the moments of Quoria's defeat, this simulated version of the Great King's past looked up at what she would one day become, and defiantly demanded to know the fate of her sisters and her people. But unlike the Great Leviathan on Fundament, Oryx was unwilling to entertain this lesser thing. He reached out his hand and took Quoria. The simulation was consumed too, but perhaps most crucially, it was never destroyed. Oryx would later gift this broken Vex mind to his sister Savathun, so that she might learn from it. He left Quoria with a degree of independence so that it could surprise Savathun. She would one day find use for the husk, but for the moment, it was of little consequence save for the fact that it was in her possession and it still contained the simulated version of Orash. With the required information recovered from the Nyka Thought Ship, the Hive assembled for what would be the grandest assault that they had ever devised. They planned to assault the Gift Mast. They had caught up to the Traveler, which had blessed a civilization known as the Harmony. It filled their worlds with light, and had granted them the most peculiar of boons, their worlds were stabilized in the accretion disk of a black hole, and from its polar jets, the Traveler had fashioned a hollow monument out of the black hole that sung with the radiance of starlight. It was called the Gift Mast, and the Hive hungered for its light. The Harmony's ten worlds were assaulted by the united forces of the siblings, as so many had been before. It was in this moment of desperation that the Harmony turned to the wishful bishops of their people, who in turn would beseech the help of wish dragons to empower them. The broods of the Hive, however, were too strong. Savathun's brood would infiltrate the Harmony, and the wish dragons would be vivisected, even as Shivur Rath's forces struggled with their bishops. After a century of war and bloodshed, 
Oryx's broods were triumphant, and tore down the gift mast so that the hive might begin to consume its light. It was once more a moment where the forces of the light were divided and conquered. But little did Oryx suspect that it would be this moment that would divide his own dynasty and leave them ripe for conquest as well. Siblings, listen. We must part ways a while so that we may grow different. King Oryx, you take up too much space. Your power constrains too many choices. I must go away from you. Savathun and Shivor Wrath were gone, both leaving so that they might develop their powers without the choking influence of the Taken King. Oryx would sit for a long time to contemplate how best to proceed. It was here that his ambition aligned with the truth of the sword logic. Oryx wished to become axiomatic with death, to embody its meaning and therefore to become one with it. In a sense, he succeeded. But that success would only come at great cost. It was here that Oryx recorded the Books of Sorrow. Within its verses, any who would attempt to vanquish him would find a means of embodying him, so long as they held a touch of malicious intent within their hearts and were willing to contain his own. But for the king to die, his tributes would have to be weakened. It began with Nocris, who betrayed Oryx by studying the secret and heretical knowledge of necromancy. The sword logic demands that the hive bring death not life or rebirth. And so, as punishment for this total affront to the sword logic, the Taken King banished his own son for all eternity. He scoured his second son's name from all the histories of the Hive and tore down every idol and dedication to him, save for one within the Dreadnought, just before his own altar. One which was immutable in its stubbornness and could not be destroyed. Thus, one source of tribute was lost to the King of Shapes. Then came the invasion of Sol. When the Hive first set their sights upon humanity and the last city, it was not believed that we would be any different from the billions who had fallen before us. It was here that Crota would be the harbinger of the Hive's great invasion, establishing the lunar fortress known as the Hellmouth. Whilst he might have been able to defeat the Guardians at Mare Ibrium and disband the army of a thousand under the Cormorant Seal that was sent to reclaim the moon, whilst he and his forces killed many great champions such as Wei Ning, Eriana III, Veltalo, and Sai Mota, his victories would only embolden the ones who would hasten his demise. For as her ghost Briar sacrificed herself to ensure her Guardian's survival, Eris Morn was able to live on in the depths of the moon's fortress. She would one day crawl out of the Hellmouth and direct Guardians back into its depths. There, they would find the keyhole into Crota's throne world in its deepest, darkest cavern. There, they would slay the first son of Oryx with his own blade by the right of the sword logic. With this, Oryx was left little choice but to respond. He arrived in Sol with all his fury and all his hatred and all his darkness. His wrath was unleashed upon the system and it would forever be scarred by his Taken, who even now infest the many worlds beneath our feet. But from within the ranks of the Guardians of Earth emerged a champion. You know the Guardian of which I speak. The one who killed his son had returned, and they returned to face the Taken King. They assembled by their side the greatest warriors in all of Sol, and at the heart of the Dreadnought, having crippled his tribute, slain his children, and silenced his court, 
They fought with the Taken King. It was here that the legacy of the Osmium Dynasty was decided. And it was here at the apex of the Dreadnought, under the witnessing eyes of the system and the darkness and the light, that Oryx would be slain by the Guardians of Earth, and his ruin would be smote upon the rings of Saturn. Oryx was dead, truly dead. The Hive were left in disarray. The Taken, once Oryx's obediently enthralled army, were now completely leaderless and scattered, directionless like animals. For a time, it seemed like the Hive might face the same fate as those that they had put to the torch. It seemed they might fade into nothingness and be broken by the resolve of the Guardians. But... As Toland the Shattered once put it, you have toppled Oryx, and you have not replaced him. There must be a strongest one. It is the architecture of these spaces. We opened a vacancy on the Osmium throne. It was only a matter of time until the dynasty moved to crown a new ruler. But hers would not be the way of swords alone. Her rule, Savathun's rule would be different. It might have seemed clear and obvious to those with any knowledge of the Hive that if Oryx died along with all his progeny, that the leadership of the Swarm would fall to the next in line. Savathun, had she been brash and foolish, might have revealed herself immediately, as Malok did, and she might have made herself an obvious target by doing so, if she had moved so quickly to claim power. But you fought her forces now. Five years of fighting her has told you what you need to know about this foe. You know her better than that. You know that she didn't move quickly to consolidate power. She bided her time, and waited to see what would last. But this was not like her other typical plans. Oryx's death was an unprecedented moment in the history of the Hive. Never before had one of the three heirs to the Osmium Dynasty's old king been slain, let alone the greatest amongst their number. To Savathun, this represented a turning point, and a moment to reflect. The Taken King had been slain, not by his own praxis under the sword logic as had long been anticipated, but by the power of the light. Perhaps there was more to its power than was first believed. And so began Savathun's many schemes. We do not know how many times truly she has intervened on our worlds since the death of her brother. But what we do know should be understood. These are the many times that we know she has tried. We know that she must have used Quaria in her schemes. Its power was the power to take, thanks probably to the simulated version of Orash it had constructed. A simulated version of the king's younger self, which would one day also learn the power to take. With Quaria in her thrall, Savathun learned to create new Taken through odd means, and would learn how to control and reorganize them into forces that would suit her own will. We learned this in the aftermath of the Red War, when a centurion of Gaul's Red Legion was seen to have been taken and was under the thrall of a new master, but had used its own organizational knowledge to direct the Taken in the European Dead Zone. It had allowed them to conquer momentarily an old hydroelectric dam, which was still in use by the civilian population. This was an area infested and frequented by many of the Taken, and yet, such a discovery may well have been the first hint that Savathun was indeed here. We saw yet more of her forces on Io as her Taken, and those under the more direct thrall of the Blade Transform entangled themselves within the very roots of the world. They were looking to abduct and take the Vex there, to serve as an army for Savathun's purposes. 
Their assaults on the localized logic engines and mass computational arrays localized within the Pyramidian on Io would also yield Savathun bounty. Bounty in the form of knowledge with which she would inform her plans. On Titan, the hive brood at the New Pacifica Arcology conducted dark studies on guardians foolish enough to fall into their clutches. They were killed, and their void light was harvested in the name of the Witch Queen. The brood constructed a massive hive shrieker, a vile thing which Savathun might have been using to watch over the system. This is the speculated purpose of shriekers, but this process was not completed. The shrieker was destroyed by guardians, who lent a swift death blow to the plan in place. Who knows what the Hive might have learned from this scheme, but one must presume that even though their Shrieker died, the idea that they were able to lay claim to even a small amount of light could have meant nothing good for the future. The Hive on Mars made dedications in the name of Savathun once Zol, the will of thousands, had perished. In the gathering gloom, it is unclear if Savathun heard the prattling of such worship. It is unclear if she even needed anything from such a weakened and treacherous brood. It might seem remarkable, but none of these schemes that we encountered in our early years may have related to Savathun's core plan. It seems that such might also have been the case with the ensnarement of Riven. Riven of a Thousand Voices was the last of the Ahamkara, the wish dragons that had once made their home in the secret bastion of the Awoken People, known as the Dreaming City. Riven had been taken by Oryx when he invaded Sol, but upon his death, her wish magic had allowed her a degree of freedom. Freedom from the typical bonds of enslavement that the Taken bear, and freedom to think as she was once again. Free will which was granted to no other Taken. It was in this moment that Savathun crept silently into the Dreaming City. It was in this moment that the Queen made a bargain, and Riven endeavoured to grant one last wish when the time was right. Today, I have a visitor. She reminds me of the king, yet subtler. Nothing announces her arrival. Her will does not flow through the system in open challenge against her enemies. She knows that though I am taken, I am beholden to no one. So, I ask her if she wishes to take up those strings. She does, and I take a new shape. My cage loses its purpose. I can tell this is not a part of her grand design. This is an introduction. She is at play. Through our new bond, I glimpse her intention. And I hope she remains at play. Together, Riven's wish magic and Savathun's control of Coria forged the last wish, the curse on the Dreaming City, which left it in a perpetual cycle of corruption and renewal as it slowly began to become more and more infested with the Taken as the three-week cycle deepened. At the apex of each three-week cycle, we would destroy Savathun's own daughter, Dulingkaru, within Marasav's shattered throne. 
and every three weeks the corruption would recede, only to begin again. You may also remember that we Guardians failed to recognize further deceit laid before us by the Witch Queen. Deceit which was masked in a recovered manuscript, calling itself Truth to Power. A manuscript which told us that facing the horrors of the Shattered Throne alone and with sufficient power would be enough to unravel the curse on the Dreaming City and save our Awoken allies. All lies, of course. But it would not stop the foolhardy and the brave from trying. But if we're to believe Riven, all of these schemes in the Dreaming City, which have impacted an entire people, these were not even the height of Savathun's power, or even part of her plans. These were merely her at play. Though whether you can trust the words of Riven, deceitful wish dragon that she is, is another matter entirely to be debated. From this moment of powerful deception, the Witch Queen would move on. She would infiltrate the Cabal next, more specifically the writing of Emperor Kallus's scribes, and she would deface his fictional recording of the future's history, sending us a secret message that she would be waiting keenly for us to meet at last. Even more daring, she would leave these very passages and notes to us in the passages describing her own fictional demise at the hands of the Cabal. But a little foolishness in the hands of the Cabal was nothing that she would induce upon her own kind. Before our assault on the Scarlet Keep and the returning of the brood of the Hive that would previously be known as Crota's Spawn, Savathun weaved her trickery about their number and sowed chaos to advance her cause. She took advantage of a plot between three disillusioned Hive siblings, a plot that would see one amongst their number tear through the Hive champions and the forces within the upper spires of their necropolis. Using this chaos, Savathun encouraged Hashladun and Besserith, two of Crota's four daughters, to consolidate power within the Hellmouth's depths. There, they would ultimately rise to lead this old brood, the Hidden Swarm. They were then encouraged to raise the Scarlet Keep in challenge to the Guardians, thanks to the whispers of the Witch Queen. Savathun also raised a mighty Hive champion known as Zulmark, who would be a guard to the darkest rituals conducted by the Daughters beneath the Necropolis. Upon further investigation of the tomes unraveled which have come to be known as the Inquisition of the Damned, it appears that Zulmak was made to be used by us, not the Hive. Zulmak would be as a mighty anvil upon which we would beat our plowshares into swords. He would be a whetstone upon which we would sharpen ourselves. Perhaps so that when we were slain at Savathun's hand, she could have become all the more powerful for our demise. Perhaps at this moment Savathun had not completely abandoned the darkness and its ways. It's not clear. To this end, Savathun would leave the trail to the creation of a most dreadful weapon, bare for all to witness, us in particular. The weapon would be known to us as the Deathbringer, whose power was stolen from the truest version of the Death Song, the Dark Aria, that to listen to was to know and to become as one with death. To listen to and to experience was to die, an Aria that if performed successfully upon a world by the correct choir could rip the world in two, an Aria which we now held in our hands with a powerful weapon. Whilst the Hive of the Moon saw these newfound powers and gifts as a means to rise against the light and challenge the Traveler and its minions once more, Savathun knew that this could only lead them to their doom. Thus was the sundering of Oryx's brood complete, was his bloodline ended, and were his heirs extinguished. Thus none would challenge her right to rule, and the vacancy that we had opened upon the Osmium throne was made complete. Now, there was only one who would stand as sovereign. Perhaps all things were going according to Savathun's plan. Perhaps something changed. Perhaps something affected her and made her believe that there was a new moment ahead in their future. It's not clear. 
but perhaps there was a moment at which she reached out to the darkness and realized that her loyalties would no longer lie with it. This was to be epitomized with the way that she interacted with us in the moments when the darkness first reached out to us and made contact with us on Io. The Witch Queen reached out to contact a pawn of her own as we did this. The exiled second son of Oryx, Nokris. Nokris, who had been abandoned by his herald Zol. Broken as he was, he could still serve Savathun's purposes, and he held secret knowledge that might be of use to her cause. So it was that when he attempted to enter the Ascendant Realm, he was snatched up and ushered into a charlatan version of the court of Savathun, the High Coven. He did not truly speak with the Witch Queen that day. She spoke to him through a shade masked by a singularity, but this shade would speak with her intent, and from their conversation, power was exchanged, and a bargain was struck. You wish to serve me. My life is spent. Servitude to those who cast me away. Our blood is all that remains of the old pact. Then let us make use of each other. What use would I be to a god? No gods. So it was always been. Teach me your necromancies. Usurper of the Ordered Way, so that together we may circumvent the anchored logic that drags us into the depths. Serve as foil to scatter the pieces of their grand game across the cosmos. As Zol did for my art, I offer a trade. Knowledge for knowledge. Grant me sight into the dreamy mind's talent, and I will teach what you ask. A rebellious bargain in the midst of dark tides. It is bound. Under my symbol, reborn and made in my image. Our bargain will set new beginnings in motion. An accord is struck. Speak my name. Savathun. Subjugate to none. Sword breaker and queen to the Taken Throne. To me, you are bonded. Go forth and enact my will. With this moment of deception, Savathun had bound Nokris to her service, learned the secrets of the exiled son's necromantic power, and had devised a plan to prevent us from potentially communing with the darkness. One that, if nothing else, would at least buy her time. However, such interference would eventually fail. With all these plans having moved, and with all these moments having been put in motion, the Witch Queen steeled herself for what was to come next. The final phase of her plan was set in motion, but her path was no longer one forged in darkness alone. Her coronation as Witch Queen would soon be at hand, and it would be conducted with the one force that we had always thought the Hive could never wield. Savathun plotted to abandon the powers of the darkness, and to take the light. But this gambit of hers would begin in perhaps the most unlikely of places, or perhaps it would be better say with the most unlikely of people. It would begin with one who had only recently become lightless. It would begin with Osiris. In his own time, I feel it would be fair to say that Osiris was once the greatest warlock in the history of the Guardian Orders. Not merely for his pure power, but for his ability to look beyond the worlds within which we all sit. When the great warlock Osiris searched across the system in an attempt to understand the cryptoliths of Shivu Arath, his ghost, Sagira, was slain. Lightless and in a moment of weakness, this was when he was most vulnerable. And in this moment, 
Savathun struck. Like an advancing shadow, she crept into Osiris's mind, and like water into soil, she corrupted him. He would be restrained and ultimately controlled by the Witch Queen. His form was hers to command, his mind was in her thrall. The words he spoke would be hers instead. And though some semblance of Osiris remained within the Witch Queen's grasp, he would not truly speak. He was now merely a mouthpiece that Savathun would use, and she would indwell within him, becoming undetectable as she played us all for fools. With her perfectly trustworthy mouthpiece, the Witch Queen crafted the situations that arose to her benefit. When Shivorath's forces pushed deeper into the system, she aided us in their destruction to prevent her sister's plans from coming to term. She lifted Crow from his position as a rogue lightbearer to that of a faithfully serving guardian. With her guidance under the guise of Osiris, Savathun would instill a sense of purpose within Crow. Ironic, seeing as she had led him to such suffering in his former life as Aldrin Sov. But in time, that suffering would be inflicted again. You know very well of that day. If I'm not mistaken, you were there at the side of the one who killed her brother. When the Cabal's newly crowned Empress Keitel and her forces threatened to destroy the last city, or annex it under Cabal rule, Savathun used her guise as Osiris to maneuver us through politics and Cabal ceremony to arrive at a point that suited her and the city. An armistice was signed between the Tower and the Cabal, and an alliance of convenience of sorts against the Black Fleet was formed. Peace between the Tower and the Cabal Ascendancy would do, for the moment. Using her power as Osiris, she claimed the Crown of Sorrow, an ancient hive artifact found upon one of the Athenaeums of the Cabal, recovered by Emperor Callus, which previously had been used in dark rituals that Savathun had also corrupted. When its first bearer, Galran, was slain by guardians, the crown passed yet again into Callus's possession, and from there he would use it upon a ship known as the Glycan, a ship which would be lost in dark space and would suffer under rituals where Callus would attempt to commune with the darkness itself. The crown was recovered by the guardians, but Osiris insisted that he should keep it, and so, it is likely that the crown fell into Savathun's clutches. Who knows what she might have learned from this dark artifact, one that in time, maybe we will see again. And yet Savathun would deepen her schemes still, by unleashing the Endless Night upon the Last City, directing Quoria to manipulate the Vex Collective to her purpose. When to her surprise the Endless Night was dissipated and Quoria was vanquished by us, she used what little influence she had left as Osiris to manipulate the city's civilian leadership within the factions. She twisted the mind of Lakshmi too into opening a Vex portal, using an old relic of the future war cult known only as the Device. The portal that she created would lead to many Vex invading and nearly tearing apart the newly founded Elixni district within the last city. In doing so, Savathun's trickery had dealt many casualties to the last city and to the House of Light. But most of all, she broke the civilian government of our city. She not only killed the faction leader of the Future War Cult, but enforced an exile for members of the Future War Cult that had not already disbanded, and for the entirety of the supporters and leadership of both New Monarchy and Dead Orbit. You must remember, not only have these people helped to ensure that the populace of the city has been kept in check, but also they represent a potent force all on their own. The new monarchy were some who helped to assist in the great efforts to reclaim the city during the Red War, and Dead Orbit's fleet, though it has mainly been assembled as a vehicle for Diaspora, still constitutes a major proportion of the city's fleet power and can be brought to bear by the vanguard if commanded. Or rather, it could have been in time. Now those aspects of power are left out in the wild for anyone with the right means to manipulate. This is a poison, a poison that has taken time to reach full potency. 
the effects are still somewhat unrealized. We will likely only feel the true power that we have lost when we need it most. But from this moment of betrayal, Osiris, or rather Savathun within the guise of Osiris, would flee and would arrive upon the shores that once before had been explored. The Dreaming City. It was here that the truth was revealed. Now Savathun sits within her chrysalis, and now Mara and her Tekians gather for their final ceremony. Soon they will be ready to excise her worm, and if Mara is to keep to her word, she will be ready to slay the Witch Queen. But you and I know better than to think this will be the end of Savathun. Even if she were to fall down and die before us, there is no guarantee that it would not be another trick. For even as a child, Savathun, once called Sathona, resolved to live a long life. If we are to truly ensure her end, we must be vigilant. And this is where you and your fire team comes in. You know the only way to kill an Ascendant Hive. You must venture into the heart of their throne world and do battle with them there, with sword and word and deed. Only there can the most final of arguments for their eradication be realized, and their plots silenced for all eternity. And so now, you understand the magnitude of the dynasty, of the battles that you shall no doubt take part in, and of the task that lies before you. And it is with this that I would ask you but a single thing. We must stand and fight, not only her, but all the heirs of the Osmium dynasty, wherever they arise. This family, this lineage, has laid waste to uncounted multitudes over the millennia. The sorrow of all those deaths may be impossible for any one person to comprehend, and yet they have put those numbers to the torch without a thought. Regardless of whether it is the Traveler's will that Savathun should see mercy, we Guardians have ultimately been the arbiters over this family's fate before. And so I implore you to do this. Hunt them down. Do not stop until they have all been silenced. Lest we should join those now faceless uncounted who died so that we might be delivered to this critical juncture. You must fight, using all the powers of the light and the darkness. You must end their dynasty. Once and for all.